Okay. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me out here. It's my first time visiting South America. So uh, I can certainly say the weather here is better than it is in Canada. <laughs> um, okay, the second thing I should say is that everything I'm about to say here is joint work with Valery Alexiev. So... So, yes, credit where credit is due. This is... Okay, so... What are we trying to do? Well, let's start off, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sort of re remind, remind people of some things that you probably already mostly know. So, a K3 surface of degree 2. Is a K3 surface. That admits. an ample divisor uh, with self-intersection 2. Self-intersection 2. And there's, you know, I mean, classically these things were studied in a slightly different way before this came along. So, um, I mean, classically, These are double covers. So, you know, if you ask somebody to name their favorite K3 surface, they'll probably say the, uh, the quartic in P3, but then if you ask them to name their second favorite, this is probably what you're going to get. Uh, they're double covers of P2 ramified over a sextic. Over a sextic curve. Okay. Okay, and I'm gonna let uh, let's let uh, B in P2 be the branch divisor. Okay. So what's our aim? Well, I mean, Bernd Sieber on Tuesday talked a bit about compactifying moduli spaces of polarized K3 surfaces, and we're interested in the problem just in the specific case where we restrict to this degree. So I'll use the same notation that he did. Uh, curly F sub 2 is the moduli space of K3 surfaces of degree 2. Curly surfaces of degree 2. Okay, so we have this moduli space, and what do we want to do? We want to compactify it. So, I mean, before I really go any further, I should probably tell you about some compactifications that people have built in the past. And then, you know, I can go on and try and tell you, you know, how we're trying to uh, improve on this. So, the first one I'm going to talk about is, uh, let's, let's say, number one. Uh, this is the Hacking's compactification. This was actually uh, Paul Hacking in his thesis. Um, I can't remember the date, actually. I think it was around about 10 years ago, but maybe a bit longer. Um, so what's the general idea of this? Well, the general idea is we identify F2 with the moduli, uh, with the moduli of pairs. So any K3 surface of degree 2, we can realize is a double cover of P2 branched along a sextic. So I mean, ultimately, F2 is really just the same as the moduli of pairs, P2, along with B, where B is a sextic curve. Uh, for B, subset of P2, sextic curve. And then we have the following definition. So, I mean, this is a, this is a special case of um, the KSBA theory, which is Karlar, Shepard, Baron, and Alexiev. Uh, for the mineral model program, but this is sort of the specialization of that to, to this particular case. So uh, if I let X be a surface, and um, when I say surface here, I mean this is something, this is not even necessarily normal. This might have multiple components, uh, and B is an effective Q divisor.
effective Q divisor on X, uh, then X comma B is a stable pair of degree six. Stable pair of degree six if the following three conditions hold. So the first one that I want is that uh, the pair uh, X along with the divisor 1 half plus epsilon times B. Epsilon is a small positive number here. So I want X 1 half plus epsilon B is semi-log canonical. If you don't know what this is, I'm not going to explain it. Uh, it's a condition on the singularities of X and the singularities of the divisor B. But the definition would take half the talk, so I'm not going to worry about that. Um, and uh, k of x plus 1 half plus epsilon times b has to be ample. OK, that's the first thing. Uh, let's say for epsilon, epsilon greater than 0. OK, so we assume this is some sort of small positive number, as epsilon usually is. Secondly, I want. I want B to be linearly equivalent to twice the canonical divisor, so, or negative twice the canonical divisor. So two, 2 times the canonical divisor plus B is linearly equivalent to 0. And then finally, I mean, finally I want to make sure that this pair smooths to P2. And then finally, number 3, uh, there is a definite divisor. There is a deformation curly x curly b of x b uh, with general fiber with general fiber p two comma sextic and. Uh, I need k of curly x and b need to be uh, q Cartier. OK, so what am I effectively saying here? Well, I'm saying I have a pair. The pair has a certain set of singularities. I want b to be negative twice the canonical divisor. That's to make sure that the double cover is a k3 surface. And lastly, I want this thing to smooth to a pair of p2 and a sextic. And then there's the following theorem, which is due to hacking, although, I mean, a lot of this is related to more general mineral model theory stuff, so there should probably be a lot of names on this, but hacking wrote the paper where it's written down. OK, so there is a compact coarse moduli space. of stable pairs of degree 6. So of course, I mean, it's obvious, you know, just looking at the definition, it's immediately obvious that the pair P2 with a sextic, a smooth sextic, instantaneously satisfies this definition. So this contains the entirety of F2, and, you know, it's compact, so this gives us a compactification. Uh, compactification, uh, which I'm going to call F2 superscript hacking of F2, uh, F2 bar superscript hacking. OK, so, you know, done. I mean, I've, I've taken 10 minutes of your time, and now I might as well go home, right? You know, there's a, there's a compact moduli space. It has a modular description. Why, why am I still standing here talking to you for the next 50 minutes? So, I mean, this, this moduli space has some advantages and disadvantages. So, so pros, uh, pros, 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 pros. I mean, we automatically get that points on the boundary give moduli 
to, de to degenerate pets. So if I pick any point on the boundary of this thing, I mean, we have an immediate interpretation of what it actually means. You know, you can go onto the boundary, you can look at a point, and you can say, well, that corresponds to a degenerate pair. You can write down what the degenerate pair is, and, you know, everything is nice. This, this is exactly the property that you want from a moduli space, right? But the big con is that uh, there is no explicit description of the boundary. So this result is really just an existence result. It doesn't give us any idea how to actually construct this moduli space or what it looks like. It doesn't tell us, you know, what does the boundary look like, what are the components of the boundary, what are their dimensions. All of that kind of stuff is completely opaque here. It's not, it's not known to us at all. So, so this is kind of what we want to do. We want to try and figure out a way of actually describing what this compactification looks like in an explicit fashion. Uh, OK, and in order to do that, we're going to compare it to a different type of compactification, which is significantly older. And this is the toroidal compactifications. So, oh, I'm not going to be able to fit compactifications on here. OK, toroidal compactifications. So how do we construct a toroidal compactification? I mean, Bernsey mentioned these, but didn't go into a lot of detail. So I'm going to give you a bit of background, at least in the F2 case. So we start off with what's called the bailey borel compactification. I'm just going to start abbreviating compactification. Now, the bailey borel compactification is, uh, it's been around for a long time. It's probably the first compactification of F2, and it's, you know, it's very, it's, it's what most people think of. And I could draw a picture of it. This is the moduli space of K3 surfaces of degree 2. And the boundary in the bailey borel compactification consists, looks a lot like this. There are, there are four lines, which are the type 2 degenerations. And then there's a point where all four of these lines meet. There's a cusp, which is the type 3. OK, so this is a very, very simple compactification to describe. It's, I think, the simplest compactification of the moduli space of K3 surfaces of degree 2 that makes any sort of reasonable sense. But again, I mean, this thing's got some problems. And the biggest problem, the biggest problem here The biggest problem is that the boundary, the boundary is very small. So in case you don't know, the moduli space of K3 surface of degree 2 is 19 dimensional. It's this massive space. The boundary in here is only one dimensional for the type 2 components and zero dimensional for the type 3 components. So you know, this thing is like co-dimension 18. It's, it's some tiny, tiny little locus. And due to this, there's. Uh, no, let's say, no useful modular interpretation. The boundary is simply too small to really give you any detailed information about singular fibers. So, you know, we can, you know, this was known for a long time that this thing was too small, so people were thinking, well, okay, how can we make it bigger? And so Mumford came along, and Mumford said, well, you know, I can, I can just describe a way of blowing this thing up, which makes the boundary bigger, and then hopefully that'll solve all of our problems. So Mumford came up with the toroidal blow-ups. And what do these look like? Well, I'll draw another picture. So. So now the type 2 components, type 2 are all divisors. 
So that's much better, right? Now we've got 18 dimensional type 2 components rather than one dimensional type 2 components. And then you get a load of junk. So there's, there's lots of components, lots of components. that come out of the cusp. OK, and it turns out that there's you know, the type 2 part, you blow up and you get a load of divisors, but the blow up of the cusp is not unique. There's actually a choice that has to be made here. So let's, let's list off the pros and cons again. So of course, the pros of this, it's very explicit. You know, I mean, there's some data of a fan, and you can read off from the fan exactly what the boundary components are, and what they look like, and what their dimensions are, and what their intersection properties. Everything you might want to know about the boundary is completely encoded here, and you can just read it off. Uh, but then there's a couple of there's a couple of disadvantages again, which are it's not unique. So it's not unique in that you have to make a choice of how you blow up the cusp here. There's, you know, there's, there's some choices to be made, and you know, there are many, many different options. And secondly, uh, it's not clear if there is a modular interpretation. So it's not clear whether this, this boundary actually gives moduli to degenerate fibers in any meaningful way. And you know, even if it does, one would expect this to be true only for one particular choice of fan. So you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's sort of lots, of lots of red herring fans here that you could pick that will give you compactifications that have no real meaning. And you know, maybe there's one which, uh, which is actually useful. So, what's, so that's, kind of the, that's kind of the history. That's kind of the history. What's our idea? Our idea is, uh, can we relate? Can we relate the hacking compactification to a toroidal compactification? Because that would solve all of our problems, right? I mean, the hacking compactification, it's completely uniquely defined. It's canonical. It has a modular interpretation. The boundary gives uh, moduli to degenerate fibers. But its disadvantage is it's not explicit. If we can link it to a toroidal compactification, then we get both the explicit description coming from the toroidal compactification and the modular interpretation that comes naturally from the hacking compactification. So this is our aim. So, I mean, before I actually try and start to explain how this might start to work, I should tell you, you know, the, uh, the toroidal compactifications are not unique, so I should tell you which one, which one we're using and what its properties are and what it looks like. Okay, so uh, let's say... a special toroidal compactification. OK. So let's, uh, let's call this thing f sub 2 bar, because it's a compactification. So I'm going to call it f sub, f sub 2 bar vs. So this is going to be called, I'm going to call it the Vinberg Scatoni. Uh, The Tony compactification. Okay, so this. Uh, okay, yeah. So this was first constructed by Vinberg and Scatoni. I mean, Vinberg did some work on fans and toilet compactifications back in the 70s, and then Scatoni in 1987, we think, was the first person to actually write down this compactification. So, uh, so how's it defined? Well, I have to tell you how to blow up the cusp, and it's defined in terms of a fan, which I'm going to call gamma vs. And what's this fan? Well, 
you'd hope it's something which arises canonically from the K3 surfaces. You'd hope it's not just sort of some completely arbitrary choice. I mean, it's supposed to correspond to the hacking compactification. That's canonical, so we want some sort of, you know, canonical choice of fan here. So what do we use? We use, it's the reflection fan. Uh, given by hyperplanes. orthogonal to minus two vectors in the lattice uh, L2, which is H direct sum E8, direct sum E8, direct sum minus two. And this lattice shows up naturally when you're looking at the moduli space of K3 surfaces of degree two. I mean, this is you know, when you're constructing the period domain, this lattice shows up naturally. So we can take a reflection fan defined by the hyperplanes orthogonal to the minus two vectors in this thing, and I can show you what the Coxeter diagram of this fan looks like, and that will help me to actually describe this compactification in sort of more concrete terms. So uh, here is the Coxeter diagram. So we start off with the triangle. Around the edge of the triangle, we have six points along each, or seven points along each side. Uh, middle, middle, middle. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Then inside the top and in the corners, there are three points connected in here. And then there are three points in the center, which are kind of a bit strange. Uh, so we have a double edge here, and a double edge here. And then symmetry, there's a double edge like this, and a double edge like this. Oh, I put it in the wrong place. Uh, a double edge like this, uh, double edge like this this, and then these three are connected by these kind of strange edges, which I'm drawing with a zigzaggy line. Okay, so this is what this fan looks like. I don't want to explain it too far, and I'm going to label the points on this. So I'm going to start off the points around the outside. I'm going to start with A1 in the bottom corner. I'm going to label them A2, A3, A4. This one's A7. This one down here is A13, and so on round up to A18. Then I'm going to label the ones on the inside connected to A1. I'm going to connect B1. B7 is connected to E7. B13 is connected to A13. And then uh, D4 is connected to A4. Uh, D10 is connected to A10. And D16 uh, is connected to A16. OK, so this is the Coxeter diagram. So how can I use this? Well. I can use this to describe the compactification or describe the blow up of the cusp. So locally, locally near the cusp, uh, the blow up looks like the uh, sub variety. of A24 with variables A, I, B, I, D, I. These are exactly the A, Bs, and Ds from this diagram, uh, defined by a set of relations. I mean, obviously, we need this thing to be 19-dimensional, so we need to have some relations between the A, I, B, I, D, I. So defined by relations. And the relations all come from a particular diagram, which I can draw. The relations all come from the following diagram, which embeds in an obvious manner into the gamma Vs. And I can put some points on here. Uh, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, 
six. Okay, so I've drawn this picture. What does this mean? Well, I'm going to put some numbers on these things. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, four, two, three, three, two, four, six, five, four, three, two, one, one, and one. Okay. So how do I get my relations out of this diagram? Obviously, I mean, there's three different ways of embedding this into this picture, and we're going to need all of them. But how do I get my relations out? Well, the relations coming from this is I just use these as the powers appearing in my, on my coefficients of AI. So if I embed it with the orientation I've got here, this down here is A17, this is A18. So I say A17 squared, A18 to the 4, A0 to the 6, B0 to the 3, A1 to the 5, going round, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera is equal to, and then I do the same thing with the other sides. So on this right-hand side, I've got 14, 15, uh, a 15 squared, a, six, uh, a 14 to the 4, a 13 to the 6, b 13 cubed, and so on. And I also have this central component. The central component involves b7 and d16. So I can write equals b7, d16. So this gives me some relations. And I can rotate this diagram, and that gives me some more relations. And it turns out these relations aren't independent of each other. They actually generate a five-dimensional set of relations. And that five-dimensional set of relations are exactly the relations that define this thing. So, so what does this give? This gives a 19-dimensional subvariety. Subvariety of A24. Which is exactly what it has to, right? I mean, this blow up is, this, this moduli space is supposed to be 19 dimensional, so we'd better get something 19 dimensional. Ah, new chalk. OK. OK, so let's start describing some of the geometry of this, of this thing. So I can, I can also describe, I can give a complete description of all of the strata. So there's the strata are divided into two types. So there's type 2 strata. Type 2 strata are classified by maximal, uh, maximal, by that I mean rank 18, parabolic, by which I mean affine Dinkin. Sub diagrams of gamma Vs. And you can check, you know, if you sit down and play with this for a while, you can check that there are exactly four such di sub diagrams. So this gives four uh, 18 dimensional dimensional strata. What are these four 18-dimensional strata? Well, when I drew the picture, these are exactly the ones that are the type 2 divisors, uh, corresponding to the type 2 divisors. OK, so that tells me about the type 2 divisors. What about all of the type 3 stuff that's coming out of the cusp? Well, I do a similar kind of, oh, I shouldn't have erased that. Oh, well, too late now. I'm not drawing it again. Hopefully, anyone who wants it copied it. Uh, so then there's type 3 strata. And these are given by a very, very similar, a very, very similar thing. These are classified uh, by elliptic. And by elliptic, I just mean standard Dinkin. I mean, not necessarily connected. They might have multiple components. Uh, by elliptic subdiagrams of gamma Vs. 
And the dimension of the stratum, dimension of stratum, is equal to the number of vertices in the diagram. And then what's more, I mean, you know, this thing is completely explicit because inclusion of diagrams corresponds to degeneration. Inclusion it corresponds to degeneration. OK. OK, so this is completely described, this, this toroidal compactification. So what are we trying to do with it? Well, it is our belief that this uh, wimberg scatoni toroidal compactification is very closely linked to the hacking compactification. And in fact, so F2 hacking and F2VS are closely linked. So we have the following theorem, which hopefully will be coming out fairly soon. We're sort of just writing it up at the moment. Here is the theorem. Uh, OK, so what does the theorem says? It says stable pairs, stable pairs of degree 6 are classified up to equisingular, equisingular deformation and it's sort of exactly what you hope it's going to be uh, by maximal parabolic slash elliptic subdiagrams of gamma Vs. So that's the first part. Moreover, such that inclusion, inclusion in the subdiagram corresponds to degeneration. So smaller diagrams correspond to more degenerate pairs. And if you have an inclusion, then there's a degeneration from one pair to the other. Uh, so what does this give us? This gives a correspondence between boundary strata in F2VS and F2 hacking. OK, so that's, that's the main result we have. Uh, since I've got some time, I might give you the sketchiest of sort of sketch, just to give you some idea of how the, uh, how the argument to prove this thing actually sort of proceeds. So. Very sketchy argument. So there's three major steps. The first step, the first step is we show show that any family of stable pairs, and this is some this is some GIT stuff. Uh, show that any family of stable pairs of degree six. can be completed uh, I should say any family of stable pairs over a punctured disk I sort of missed that out anyway any family of stable pairs of degree 6 over the punctured disk can be completed which oh okay <laughs> sorry I thought it was a question okay any family of stable pairs of degree 6 can be completed uh, uh, what 
what am I saying here? I don't want to say with, that's why. By adding a not necessarily stable uh, pair of standard type. Uh, I don't really want to go into what, uh, to what this means, but effectively we show that if you take a family over the punctured disk, then you can glue in a fiber, you know, to complete to a complete family. This fiber is not necessarily stable, but it has a sort of geometry that we can understand and that we can write down. And then we say, well, okay, we want to get from this to a stable pair, but we want to do so in a controlled fashion. So then the next step, the next step is show that there is a, a sequence of elementary modifications, elementary modifications taking the central fiber to a stable pair of degree 6. that we can control. And then the problem boils down to saying, well, you know, we need to know all of these pairs of standard type, but because we were careful when we constructed them, we can write down, you know, a complete classification of what the pairs of standard type have to look like. And then we say, well, we run this sequence of elementary modifications, and the situation is the elementary modifications are something, they're sort of very small steps that we have complete control over. So you move along and each time you do an elementary modification, we can then say, well, this is the fiber you get out, this is the fiber you get out. You keep running until you eventually get to a stable pair of degree six. And this just gives you the classification of stable pairs of degree six. degree six. And then what do you do? Well, you just sit there and you say, well, okay, now we can observe that there's a, uh, there's a correspondence with the elliptic subdiagrams. And, you know, once you, once you have the stable pairs of degree six, it just kind of immediately drops out that this, that this works. Okay. Okay. So, so that's what we have so far. Now, of course, we'd like to have more, right? I mean, this theorem says there's a correspondence between the boundary strata, but you know, what we'd really like to do is be able to actually say, you know, there's some sort of correspondence between these things as actual moduli spaces, rather than just you know, some, sort of, some sort of map between boundary strata. So here is a conjecture that we're working on, and we've been working on for quite some time, which we hope is going to be true. And the conjecture is uh, there is a modular family of stable pairs of degree six degree six over this Wimberg's Cotoni compactification. Okay, so what does this, you know, if this were true, what does this tell us? Well, because the hacking compactification is basically a moduli space of these things, this would tell us, uh, uh, this would imply that there is a map from the Wimberg's Cotoni compactification to the hacking compactification. And because, you know, we have a complete understanding of the stable pairs of degree six, I mean, we know how this map is going to uh, map on the boundary divisors. So, you know, I mean, the idea is we'd be able to completely describe this map, everything you might want to know about it, and then 
from that, this gives the desired explicit description of the hacking compactification. You know, you can just say, well, okay, there's some map from the Vimbo Scatoni compactification down to there. We can say what it does, you know, I mean, if it's some sort of covering or whether it's got, you know, or if it's some sort of covering on the boundary or whether it's got some sort of, you know, whether there's some components that get contracted or some things or, you know, I mean, this, we could make a, we could give a, a, an absolutely complete, uh, an absolutely complete description of what this map is doing. Okay, so, you know, I've thrown this conjecture out there and aside from our theorem, why should you believe that this is true? Well, I'm sort of gonna go back to some nice explicit stuff, so here is a bit of evidence, something very suggestive. So let's consider, let's consider the degree six uh, it's sort of a restricted degree six, but let's consider the degree six Veronese embedding. Of P2. By the following. Monomials. Okay, so I'm going to draw. I'm going to draw a picture. So I'm taking P2 and I'm mapping it into, what do I want, P18. So this is not quite the full, I mean the full degree six Veronese embedding would take me to P27. This is not quite everything. Uh, and I'm gonna call the monomials X1, X2, up to X18 and Z. And what are these things? Well, if I draw the triangle of sextic monomials, uh, let's make it bigger. One, 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 one. This P2 is in, uh, let's say, U1, U2, and U3. That's probably some bad notation. Okay. So U1, U2, and U3, what are those going to? Well, they're going to uh, U1 to the 6, U1 to the 5, U2, and so on. And then the last one is uh, U1 squared, U2 squared, U3 squared. And I can draw this on the diagram and it will be immediately obvious what's going on. So down here I have u1 to the 6, that's the same as x1. Then I have u1 to the 5, u2, that's the same as x2. Then I have u1 to the 4, u2 squared, that's the same as x3. And so on, when I get up to here, this is u2 to the 6, that's x7. When I get down to here, this is uh, u3 to the 6, that's the same as x13. Uh, and then in the center, I have z, and z is u1 squared, u2 squared, u3 squared. So I just ignore the monomials, which sort of, you know, there's some extra monomials which should live in here, but I just ignore those ones. Okay. So I write this thing down, and then we can say, well, okay, what are the relations? What are the relations defining this, the image of this? the relations defining the image here. What are we getting? Well, I'm going to use some suggestive coefficients. I'm going to say ai squared times xi cubed times z is equal to xi squared, sorry, xi minus 1 squared, xi plus 1 squared. And what's this for which i's? This gives me for uh, i is 1, 7, and 13. So if you look at this diagram, this is exactly the corners. Okay, and that's three relations. Three relations. Uh, then I've got some more which correspond to edges. It's AI times XI squared is equal to XI minus one, XI plus one. And that's for all the other I's. I not equal to one, seven, and 13. This is the edges. And there's uh, 15 of those. And then finally, I've got a set of relations which are di times z cubed 
is equal to uh, xi squared xi plus 9. Uh, and this is for i is equal to, uh, now hang on, this should be 3, 10, and 16. And this is the axes of symmetry. And there's three of those. OK, so this gives me a total of uh, 21 relations. And there's 21 coefficients here. And the, you know, the numbering of the, the, the labeling of the coefficients is pretty suggestive. So firstly, I should say these generate all relations. I mean, there's lots of relations you can write down, but these are enough. And moreover, so you know, this gives me the P2. How do I get this? Gives me the P2 embedded in here. How do I get the sex stick? Uh, so the sex stick in P2 is given as the intersection with the hyperplane. Uh, which is the sum over i of xi plus z equals 0. OK. So we intersect with that hyperplane. That gives us our sextic. So this gives us, this gives us a sextic in P2. OK. But I've got too many relations here, right? I mean, I want, you know, I'm living in, I'm living in P18. I want a surface. So that means that I need to have I really only need uh, 16 relations. I've got 21. That means I've got five redundancies living in here. Now, the labeling that I put on here means, you know, there's not a lot of prizes for guessing. Uh, what are the relations between the AIs and the DIs? Well, it turns out. It turns out uh, that they are exactly exactly the restriction of the relations defining uh, F2 bar Vs. The restriction to what? Well, we don't have any Bi's appearing here. And we don't want to set the bi's to 0. That will kill all of our relations. So what are we doing? We're to the locus uh, bi equals 1 for all three of the i's. OK, so what can we actually? So this is giving us, this is giving us a family. So what's this doing? This is giving us a family of P2s with sex sticks living in them, which is living over a sublocus of this, uh, this compactification. So I can say one can do some toric geometry. And this is really stuff originally due to GKZ. And what can you prove? You can prove this defines a family of stable pairs over uh, of degree 6. Over the locus. Bi equals 1 in the Wimberg Scatoni compactification. So, this is actually a family of stable pairs. Uh, this is a 16 dimensional locus. And what's more, I mean, I suppose, how should I say? I mean, Probably the best way of saying this is uh, compatible with our earlier theorem. So, 
So the stable pair living over, you know, the stable pair, in each place where this intersects a divisor on the boundary, you get a degenerate stable pair. And the degenerate stable pairs that show up in this family are precisely the ones that are predicted by the, uh, by the theorem that I discussed earlier, the classification of the stable pairs. So, so, I mean, you know, where can one go from there? Well, it turns out that, you know, this is not the only family you can construct. So, uh, one can also construct other 16-dimensional families with the same properties. So what does that mean? Well, that means, you know, all one has to do, all one has to do, where all, there's a lot contained in the all, is all one has to do is find a 19-dimensional family which, you know, extends these to the entire moduli space. And then, you know, the, the, the conjecture will be proved. So all in inverted commas that remains is to extend these families to the full 19-dimensional moduli space. But it turns out that's, that's really very far from being an easy thing to do. So that's where we are right now. OK, thanks for your attention. <laughs> hmm.